You can do better than that. Come on, Merry Christmas. <laughs> Amen. I, I'm excited because uh, this is the first chance I've had to see my son in person. He was just promoted to Lieutenant JG in the Navy. Congratulations. <laughs> To make it from Ensign to Lieutenant JG, it's a very intense test. You have to fog a glass. <gasps> You're in. <Yeah. laughs> they check if your pulse is still working. Okay, here you go. There you go. No, he's done very well. Well, um, it's good to be with you. I've been gone for, for two weeks. So we, we told, thank you. Good to be seen by you. Yeah. We told Micah 18 months. That meant 18 hours. <laughs> yeah. He's been doing the last two weeks. Uh, Michelle and I were in the first weekend, we were in Mar-a-Lago for the uh, Turning Point USA Gala, and uh, it was remarkable. Um, They were expecting a huge downturn in giving because of the economy, it's just terrible, and inflation is through the roof, and um, and it was fascinating because at the end of the event, it was unexpected. A woman gets up there, she's barefooted, I think she has like eight foster kids or something, I don't know, and she's a widow, her husband died, and she steps up and kind of unscripted and everyone's wondering what's going on. And, and she's a little out there too, which is kind of cool. She's, I mean, you go to a gala barefooted. I mean, that's, that says something. It's like, and she's got that kind of money. It's like, I don't care. All right. I can do this. I'm barefooted. Yes. Mm-hmm. But she, she donated $5 million. Yeah. We marveled at the generosity of so many folks in a very difficult time. Uh, people were sacrificially giving in many respects, and it was, it was profound to witness. Meeting so many people, hearing so many heart-wrenching stories and so many things that are happening, and I, I have great hope for the future ahead. It's, it's exciting to kind of see a paradigm shift happening. I, I believe it with all my heart. I'm witnessing it as we, we just stand back and watch God move. I'm seeing a hunger for truth like I've never seen before. It's very exciting. People have been sick of being fed lies. And then uh, we, we came back and recouped and then went to the um, America Fest, which is the largest conservative gathering of young people across the country. Last year, there were 10,000 people. This year, it was 13,000, 30% growth. It was huge. It was a remarkable event. Usually, they do the faith aspect of it at 7 a.m. in the morning, Sunday morning. Nobody shows up because Saturday night's kind of filled with festivities and you know, a handful of diehards show up and you get to preach to 12 people. Um, but they did it in the evening this year. And what we've come to witness, and it's a paradigm shift with Turning Point, which is very exciting to me, uh, Charlie has infused faith in, in a very large capacity at Turning Point. It's now the fuel that drives the entire, entirety of the organization. And I'm so proud of him and watching as lives are being profoundly touched and changed. Because if you roam the streams of liberty, you're going to come to its source, and the source is Jesus. Um, yeah. Come to set the captive free. And then Michelle and I came back and uh, had a little bit of a gathering last night, uh, just intimate, 40 people, and uh, <laughs> just family, <laughs> mostly her side. <laughs> so, Tom and Dee are very prolific. They celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary. Congratulations to my in-laws. <laughs> and so we had a great time last night. And then as I was reflecting on the message uh, last night and this morning, it, it was overwhelming with gratitude. And my heart's full of, of just thanks. Thankful for you guys. I travel the country and this little church has made a big difference. People speak of you. Michelle and I are so honored to be a part of all of it. And just to watch what God's done with a little congregation touch so many lives. And I, I was just thanking the Lord last night, just spending time thanking him. And I, I was doing a reading as I was kind of preparing for a long-term study through the book of Acts and just refreshing myself in the narrative of the early church. And I came across chapter 20 and there was a verse there that jumped out at me that we'll share momentarily that kind of inspired today's message. But it was also the reading of the Christmas story that inspired it. So if you have a Bible, if you'd open up to Luke chapter two, if you don't, the folks back there will hand you one. I think there's one person. Yeah, there's two. We got two people who hand out Bibles. You raise your hand, they'll give you one. We're going to be in Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. This is always the hardest sermons because folks only come for Christmas and Easter only, and you've got to find something original. 
And they're like, yeah, I've heard that one too. I've been doing this for 22 years. By the way, you have a title, if, that, if that's you. You're a CEO Christian. Christmas and Easter only. We're thrilled you're here. Yeah. My mother used to be irritated at CEO Christians because she'd get to church early and go to get her seat and somebody had already taken it. And she goes, these people. <laughs> Mom, they're in church. Yes, but they should have come later. <laughs> Bless her heart. Yeah. So Luke chapter two, before we stand for the reading of the word of the Lord, I just wanted to uh, point out that um, it was Christmas where the Lord got a hold of my heart. For the very first time, I experienced his presence. Uh, my family wasn't a church-going family by any stretch of the imagination. We had one recited prayer that we had memorized that sometimes we said at dinner, but then I think by the time I was 12, that went out the window. I don't remember ever praying with my family for the most part or reading the Bible. I, I never recall that. There was never an open Bible in our home. And I remember I was in high school and it was Christmas Eve, and, and the, the Methodist church was right across the street from the high school, and they had a, a banner that was promoting their Christmas Eve service, so I had seen the time every time I'd leave my class, and I knew that, I just didn't know what a church was all about, but I saw the time, and I thought Christmas Eve service, and I got to the house that night, and our family is a very impatient family, the McCoy side, and the Coletti side, Michelle's side of the family, they're like, no, we're going to wait till Christmas to open the gifts, and then they don't open the gifts at Christmas. You got to do the stockings first, and you have to have breakfast, and then maybe if you're still alive, you could open the gifts, you know. <laughs> yes, dear. And it's my mother-in-law. She's adamant. You open those after breakfast. And so that's been the tradition which totally erased my family's tradition, which is Christmas Eve, oh, everything's open. <laughs> and then at Christmas, you're like, I don't know, let's sleep in, you know? So, yeah, amen. And I always marveled at the amount of time and effort that went into wrapping these gifts and these beautiful bows and just all the niceties and it just, it's just frayed everywhere. And then you're sitting surrounded by your baubles and trinkets and hopefully you got the things you wanted and you're overwhelmed and you're excited and all of a sudden it just starts to fade a little bit. And you're, then, you, then it just, is that all there is? It's just kind of the depression moment. You're like, and everyone's in their corner playing with their new gadget or whatever and, and some people are, you, you can't eat anymore, you're so full. Just layers of food. <laughs> Our, yeah. Geologists will unearth you one day. <laughs> Well, this was a Messioic era, and this is a Paleolithic, and, and of course, it was a drought that year. That's why he's skinny here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> First service was even better. <laughs> but I, but I, was, I was sitting there, and depression hit in, and it, it, it clicked. It's, you know, I remember seeing the banner, so I, uh, on my own accord, nobody was really doing anything. I just put some shoes on, got a jacket, and walked down to the church, across from the the high school. And I got there late and uh, got up into the balcony of this tiny little Methodist church, sat in the back row of the balcony, the only seat available. I sat there and, and, they, they be, and it was strange. They had a female minister, which I, I didn't think that that was normal, but apparently I hadn't been to church, so I guess things had changed. And some of you are like, well, yes, they have. <laughs> Good for you. Well, it's not changing here. <laughs> so that's what they're saying. And so it upset some people there. I'm sorry. Not at all. Because uh, that's what the scripture says. We just follow the word. And I, there's women who can preach better than I can. I had no doubt on that. Probably pastor better than I can. But you got to take that up with the Lord. I, that's not my deal. He, he's the one who wrote it out. And so... I'm up there, and this female minister, and, and I was young enough, raised in a conservative home, and the stuff she's saying, and back then it was Sandinistas in Nicaragua, and she's siding with the Sandinistas. I'm like, this is Coronado. It's a military town. You're not going to be around long if you keep this up. She'd just been brought in, and she was a lesbian. She was talking about her spouse and all that, and I'm like, oh. <laughs> but, but, you know, and, and I was thinking, why am I here? It's like a TED Talk. You know, it's just awful. Back before there were TED Talks. And, and then all of a sudden they start doing the, the Christmas hymns. And just the, the words and the music, so familiar over a period of time. I remember my mother would, she loved Christmas carols. 
She played the piano. She probably had about 10 songs in her repertoire, seven of which were Christmas hymns, Christmas carols. And they began to sing. And the, and the presence of the Lord just profoundly touched me. I started weeping and that, that I didn't know why. But, but I, I just knew he was, he was real. And, and my heart was full. Contrasting that with the gift opening. It's just, this one was consistent. And I, I, I just found myself weeping back there and listening to the words and my heart was full and I was overwhelmed with gratitude. I love the passage where it says giving thanks. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ his son. Right? I stink at singing, so. But, but there's a giving that comes in thankfulness, giving thanks. My mother taught me that. She was a meticulous thank you note writer. You get a gift or you go and get invited to someone's house, you write a thank you note immediately. Immediately. You don't, you don't dilly-dally. You don't postpone. You get that thing written. I mean, they would, they would come to the house. They'd bring a gift. And by the time they went home, my mother had couriered their thank you note to be there before they arrived. And she had really remarkable handwriting. And she, she, was, she insisted that we write thank you notes for every gift we received. And I couldn't wait to get out of the house and never have to do that again. Because I started to realize it was a little different than being thankful. My mother was thankful, and she was very um, mindful of that. She was a generous woman, but um, I think it was part of the military um, environment that your husband would get promoted if you were mindful of, of the, the social niceties of writing thank you notes. It leaves a lasting impression. And, and my mother was good at that. She was very good at that. Um, and, and they were generous people. My parents were very generous. There, there was always, always room at the table for a drop-in dinner guest, always. My mother would spend every Sunday at um, uh, the convalescent home. She'd make us all go. I grew up with the smell of urine and you know, sitting next to some woman who would massage my hand for three hours, thinking I'm somebody she's related to. And my mother would be going to each room visiting and, and I, I, I started to realize this is something that was special to her. My dad was a very generous man. There was one woman who'd been divorced uh, on our block. Her three sons were my playmates, and they were destitute as a result of what the man had done. And that Christmas, my parents bought all their gifts. And I never knew about that till later when she told me when she was older. My parents did a lot of things like that. I remember one time in particular, my dad, he had been a lieutenant. My son is now Lieutenant JG, next is Lieutenant. As a lieutenant, he had command of a ship called the USS Summersworth, which is unheard of for a lieutenant to have, be the commanding officer of, of a Navy vessel. And it was an offshore, it was a, it was a mine sweep, uh, the USS Summersworth. And um, they were part of the submarine fleet and they're testing depth charges, uh, sonar by blowing up charges at certain depths in the water to read the sonars, like new technology. And they couldn't get the, the charge to detonate at a certain depth, and so they brought on a munitions expert. Expert. Um, and so he took the cylinder, uh, and, and the detonating charges could only fit six, and there was room for maybe a seventh, but they couldn't quite get it in there, so he decided to hammer it in. That's an expert for you. Boom, blows up the ship. The, the, there was three-quarter inch steel grating on the bridge that folded over and saved my father's life. My dad ran down. The bosun's mate's arm was missing. He was bleeding out from his carotid artery. I don't know. My dad applied pressure, and they summoned the Queen Mary, and it's written in the log books. It was on the front pages of the paper, uh, New York Times, and the, the, the Queen Mary had to circle three times to cool the boilers to come alongside because they're the only ones that had a, a doctor on board and got the wounded on on the Queen Mary, saved their lives. My dad was facing a court-martial because you have an explosion on board ship, it all rests with the commanding officer, and as a lieutenant, his career is in trouble, and uh, he's awaiting charges. He's gonna be bought, brought before a court, and here he's got shipmates that are in the hospital, and he would drive from his home up to Groton, Connecticut, in the submarine location where the 
wounded were, and he'd visit them every day. It was a a three-hour drive one way from my father, and he'd drive back. He was with the executive officer, and they were playing hearts because they were the only two people in the world that didn't have to face the press, so they'd stay at home, play hearts, and the commanding officer, the executive officer got a little testy (laughs) during hearts, and my dad's competitive, and my dad was just whooping him, and the guy got up and punched my dad and broke his jaw. So now he's a lieutenant facing court martial, and he's got his jaw wired shut. Oh, it's delightful. Let's have some more baby food. And sucking it all through a straw. And, and it was probably one of the most trying times of his life. And I remember they wanted to do a ship's reunion for the shipmates of the Summersworth because the city of Summersworth, New Hampshire, was dedicating a park to this famous ship. And they wanted my dad to come. He was the only commanding officer still living and he was in the throes of Alzheimer's, so I went as kind of a caretaker on the trip. We get to Summersworth, New Hampshire. My dad doesn't know where he is, what he's doing. He's still a bit coherent. And, and we get to the reunion, and they dedicate the park, and my father doesn't say any words, but he's, he understands this is something important, and he's carrying himself well. And then we went over to the um, Legion Hall, and we were there, and a man comes up with a prosthetic arm. I know exactly who he is because I heard the stories a number of times. And he's got his two boys with him. And my dad's with me. And he he looks at me and he says, I know your father doesn't know who I am. um, But my boys are here (laughs) because of your dad. He saved my life. He said, did you know that he visited me every day in the hospital? I said, no, sir, I didn't. He said, "You, you got a good dad there. I said, yes, sir. And he said... He's left a lasting impression on my life. His first son's name was Roy. His other son's name was Edgar, which was my dad's middle name. That's a lasting impression. My folks were givers. They were sweet, always generous. And and I I reflected on that, and I I wanted to be that way. I'd been been touched through my my entire life by generous people, Uh, one in particular... I'll share with you momentarily as a man named Harold Mancellian. I'll share with you about him, but I, I want to give you a reason why all this is ruminating in my head, and I pray it ministers to you. It came out of the passage in Luke chapter 2. Would you please stand for the reading of the word of the Lord? Oh, <laughs> you're being rather thorough. <laughs> Thanks, Micah. Luke chapter 2, we'll pick up at verse 8. I'll read out loud if you'll follow along silently. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were greatly afraid. And the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all the people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. God was giving the world a savior. Some folks in the room right now don't think you need one. Well, that doesn't make for a very pleasant Christmas. Everyone needs a savior. You may not think you need one, but you do. I didn't, but God showed me I did. He was gracious to me. We'll cover this passage shortly, but it's a gift For born unto you this day in the city of David, a savior. It's a gift. God's giving you a savior. It's the greatest gift the world has ever received. Lord, we ask your blessing on the study of your word, and we thank you for this gift of your son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Lord, thank you. Thank you that you are the savior of the world. Thank you that you left the glory of heaven's throne for the humiliation of an earthly cross. That you would pay the penalty of our sin and then by your death, burial, and resurrection we would have the hope of eternal life awaiting us. Lord, we thank you that your death on the cross was sufficient for all the world's sins but only efficient for those who would receive that gift. And so Lord, at this time of year, giving gifts and receiving gifts, may we not overlook the greatest of all of them. Help us, Lord. Please, God, make this Christmas special. 
more than ever before. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, have a seat. Relax. Not too much. Don't fall asleep. <laughs> Given unto you this day in the city of David a Savior. It's a gift from God, a Savior for all the world. I, I came across this passage when I was reading in Acts, and, and I, I alluded to it earlier Paul is writing to the elders at the church in Ephesus, and he says these words, which is fascinating, at the conclusion of his remarks to the church at Ephesus. He says, and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. I've read all four Gospels numerous times. I've read the entirety of the New Testament numerous times. I've read all 66 books of the Bible at least seven times cover to cover. And I have never found those words leaving Jesus' mouth in anywhere in the scripture. Is Paul lying? No. John 21, 25 tells us what's occurred. This is the last verse of the last chapter of the Gospel of John. And there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen. Yeah, Jesus did say that. It's more blessed to give than to receive to give. You know, the Lord loves a cheerful giver, not out of guilt or compulsion. I've never in 22 years of ministry passed an offering bag in this church, and I never will. I've never asked you for a dime, and I never will. This is an act of worship. It's not for me to run a business and cajole you and guilt you compel you that's not the point the idea is for God so loved the world that he gave if we're Christians Christ like we give but it's an act of worship it's not out of guilt or condemnation if I can if I can sway you to give by manipulative words find a new church I mean it and people say well you know how do you get the bills paid We put a box in the back. Well, how do they know where to put it? They figure it out. And that's true. And for 22 years, I'll tell you a little secret. You are are per capita the most generous church, I think probably in the country. And I've never asked you for a dime of that. Not once, it's been joyfully given. There's something about a giver that makes life special. There's some folks that aren't very good at giving. They're good at taking. And they love to be around givers. I've noticed that, that as Michelle and I travel the country, we were brought in, and we we always say this phrase, we know we're doing something right when God surrounds us with people like the ones we meet. They're a unique portion of Christendom that are the most generous people you could ever imagine. And Michelle Michelle and I feel it our burden to protect them from from the greed of others. Because people love to receive. They just don't want to give. And so you have these generous people and everyone wants a connection to them so they can pitch their ministry. I just, I I don't have patience or time for that. The Lord can speak to them. Why don't you go to the Lord in your prayer closet and let him know what your needs are. Let not your needs be known. Let Father, your Father in heaven know and he'll meet your needs in the riches of Christ. But we want to work people. We want to, we want to milk them. And so Michelle and I go through life and we see that this is our calling. And, and there, are, there are folks that are really good at giving. There's others that are really good at, at receiving. Uh, I spoke of my godfather. He died at 100. He, he, was, he was the tightest human being I've ever met. He was a, he was a depression era, 16 years old in the Great Depression. He, he saved everything. Jesus saves and so did Uncle Bob. <laughs> Just different stuff. Jesus was saving humans. He was saving my money. And, um, you know, the bill would come and my, 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 50 years I'd known him. My dad, you know, my dad was, he was always his commanding officer. You would think the commanding officer would pick up the tab. You know, he's, he's, he's got residual income. Nah, no. The bill would come and Uncle Bob, you know, hey, let me get that. And he'd get pterodactyl arms.
And my dad would do the waiting game, and after a while, it was just silly. He'd just go, I got that. And he knew that he was going out with Uncle Bob that they had to, you know, save, because he'd order the stuff, good stuff. And you go to his house, and he had bottles of liquor that had never been opened. They, they were just sitting there, and they were probably rotten. But, you know, it was like, I'm generous to give it to you, but don't, don't drink out of that, because they're stylish, and we want to keep the levels even. <laughs> and my dad would always pick up the tab. My dad didn't think twice about it. He was always giving, always giving. And, and I, I grew up um, and, and came to Christ. And, and I remember Michelle and I were, we were just completely broke. And they had made an ultimatum to me at the church we were working at that if I didn't have a seminary degree or wasn't working towards a seminary degree, I couldn't remain in the employment of this congregational church. So I went down to the local seminary and I enrolled. Joyce Workington was in charge of admissions and I enrolled in the seminary, and it was $395 a unit. Each class was three units, which already exceeded my paycheck. And there was no way I was going to be able to pay for this. And I, Michelle and I are looking. We're going to have to get new employment. We're going to lose this opportunity to serve in the church. But I signed up for the classes because, you know, that's what you do when you have the gift of faith. It wasn't faith. It was desperation. I'd like to think that I'm this powerhouse of faith, but I, I struggled too. I'm like, we're going to have to find a new job. We're not getting, there's no way. And I remember the phone rang, and it was Joyce. And I knew this was bad news that, you know, Michelle and I are going to have to leave our employment because uh, the deadline's come. And I said, hi, Joyce, I, I don't have the money. She says, that's not why I'm calling. She said, I already have the money. I have a check here for you for your book money. I'm like, why do I need books for classes I can't take? She says, no, your tuition's paid. I'm like, who did that? She says, I'm not at liberty to say. I said, really? Well, it was, it was that season of the year where we'd take all the kids down to Mexico at spring break, and we'd build houses, and I went down to Farmer's Lumber with Harold Mancelli, and he died when he was a little over 100. He'd only left Fresno twice, once for army training in World War II, and once to go back for a reunion, and he lived in Fresno the entirety of his life, owned Farmer's Lumber and Farmer's Finance, Never went on vacation, just worked and worked and worked. And he was a happy man. And it was kind of a dilapidated building, but he was a sweet man, and he'd save everything. And um, really frugal in that respect, old clothes, beat up trucks and stuff like that. But he was, he was wealthy. And I went down, and I asked him for lumber to build these houses. And he said, yeah, sure. And he loads me up. And he goes, you're going to need plumbing supplies. I said, yeah. And he says, um, why don't you check? Uh, let, me, let me make a call, and he calls the plumbing guy. He says, I'm going to send a check over, and the, the supplies will be waiting for you. He gave it to us at cost. I said, okay. He said, Rose will have the check for you. And Rose was a Japanese-American who had been interned in the Japanese camps, internment camps during World War II. When she got out, Harold gave her her first job, and she had worked with him the entirety of her life, as did almost every employee. They loved Harold. So I went over to Rose's desk, and she said, you know what? It's over in the other file. Let me go get it. And her desk was stacked with files. And I had just finished leaving the seminary when I was in the quad with a couple of other seminary students, and five of them, or six maybe, um, were all commenting that they were um, being taken care of by a, ben a benevolent benefactor paying their tuition. I'm like, oh, I'm not the only guy. And I get there, and, and I'm waiting at Rose's desk, and I look down, and she didn't cover it. It wasn't like I was being nosy. I just saw my name, and it was a file under a file of the other guys that I had just met, one girl. And it was all of the receipts that he had been paying for my seminary and all of theirs. And not to know about that. Harold was a remarkable man. Very generous. He used to say, I live more simply that others may simply live. He gave sacrificially. He's a lovely man. I met so many people like that in the course of my ministry that it developed me before I ever arrived here at God Speak. One of the first books I had the privilege to pick up and read was George Mueller of Bristol by A.T. Pearson. It was written many, many years ago, but George Mueller was a Prussian immigrant who, uh, his pagan life was, was, I don't think anyone can compete with what he had done. And he found himself destitute having spent all of his father's money. And in his despair and, and emptiness, he cried out to God and came to Christ and immigrated to Bristol, England, which at the time had these urchins, street urchins of abandoned children, orphans that were all over the streets. 
no one caring for them. And he was burdened to share Christ with them and care for them. And so he started orphanages in Bristol, England that grew to huge stature. Their annual budget today would be about $10 million as he cared for tens of thousands of orphans. And he never, ever asked for a penny from any human being. He only asked of God. And God used human beings to meet that need. There'd be times where there'd be no food in the cupboards, there'd be nothing left, and he would gather the staff, and they would pray, and he'd say, set the table, and let's give, give, it's better to give than to receive, let's give thanks for what God's about to do. And they would pray, there'd be a knock at the door, the bakery wagon lost its wheel, and all of a sudden the bread's sitting there, and another knock at the door, the milk truck lost its wheel, and they had milk, and finally after a while, the the merchants were like, we don't need a broken wheel. Let's just bring it by, you know. <laughs> Obviously, God wants the food to end up here. And, and so when he died, and, and he had journals that, that he had massive entries. They're, they're voluminous. Um, and, and they're revered to this day and protected uh, at the library there where he would write of God's provision continually. And when he died, all he had to his name was a, an old worn out coat and two silver spoons. He lived his whole life as a giver. And I attended um, a funeral service for Foster Freeze, who was very generous, gave the first largest gift to Turning Point USA. And as I sat through this funeral service, so many people came up commenting about how Foster had touched their lives. That most of the people in the room had no idea that Foster had even done anything in that area. Countless stories like this. The man just gave without knowledge of who he was giving to and so many lives were touched. And I remember sitting there and the Lord said to me, I want you to be more generous than Foster. I thought, all right, you give me his money, you know, I'll do what I can. <laughs> and the Lord said, no, no, no. I want it by percentage of what you already receive. You see, there's only two things we can bring to the equation as Christians, godliness with contentment. That's great gain. Are you content? And are you godly? Godly meaning are you right with the Lord? Because that's what gives you a fullness in life. And I thought, I'd like to be like that. Michelle and I had a really sweet experience these last couple weeks where a number of people would come up to us and say, do you remember when you did and you gave me and, that said, and I, don't, I don't know who they are. I have no idea what they're talking about. And I thought, this is what it's like. Where your right hand doesn't know what your left hand's doing and it becomes as natural to you as breathing. I don't know how many breaths I've taken in the course of a day, and I don't remember giving to you. And I used to wear watches, and people would say, I like your watch, I'd give it to them. And now I just realized that there was people waiting in the wings, like, no, I don't want that watch. <laughs> oh, that's a good, hey, can I, I like your watch. <laughs> and then I realized there's snakes out there, so I just don't wear watches anymore. <laughs> but there's no possession I'm gonna hold on to that's more valuable than a human heart. And the Bible says, store your treasures in heaven where moth and rust will not destroy and thieves will not break in and steal. And the only thing going to heaven is people. And God's not going to hold you accountable for what you've amassed in a fortune that you died and left to someone else. You didn't give that. You died. He, he had no ability to give it. Well, I put it in my will. Well, thank God there's a country that's going to honor that will. It's only going to be a part of how you've lived your life to develop such a system. But you don't give anything when you die. You give it when you're alive. And I just said, Lord, I want to be... I wanna be a hilarious giver. I just, I don't want to have a, a hold on anything in life. And, and you go through life and you think, you know, if I give, I'm not going to have my reserves. You talk to a financial planner, you need about four million in the bank for your reserves if you're going to retire and you want to, I'm like, I'm only about four million short. <laughs> People were asking me when I told about my announcement of, of stepping aside and Micah becoming senior pastor and me being pastor emeritus. They go, what does emeritus mean? I go, it's Latin for you're going to pay me until I die. <laughs> kidding, kidding. <laughs> Somewhat. <laughs> but, but it's this idea that you, you, you just don't worry. You don't, you don't have any cares about stuff like that. Countless times God has provided in, in the thick of it and I, I have come to appreciate and to love generous people. And the Lord says it's better to give than to receive. There's something that God is giving you today. 
But, but with any gift, if I'm holding it out and it's nicely wrapped and I've taken time to present it to you, you're, you're, gonna, you're either gonna receive it or not receive it. Yeah, it's a gift, but if you don't take it, it's not yours. For unto you this day in the city of David is born a savior. It's a gift. And the only thing stopping you from taking it is, is one word called pride. I don't need a savior. Really. You don't need a savior. What, what's your plan on exiting this earth? I mean, you, you obviously got a plan on your retirement. What's your, what's your plan on exit? Are you just hoping that it's just some cosmic energy and you're just matter and you're gonna dissipate and your memories are gonna flood into some artificial intelligence? And what a, what a tragic life that would be. You have no idea where you're going and you don't know why you're here. Hello? Is anybody out there? What, what's the point of living if there are no absolutes and there's not a, a designer? Everything about it screams of a designer, yet you don't need a savior? Are you right with him? Have you reconciled to him? Is there a part of your life that you know is wrong because of conviction and, and you don't want anyone to see a videotape of what you think in secret or you've done in secret? That's separation from God. He's given you a savior to save you from your sin, to reconcile you to the Father so your name can be written in the Lamb's book of life and you can live in, in heaven forever. But I don't need that. I'm a self-made man. I, I laugh at that. Every time I hear someone say that, I just look at them and go, what part of yourself did you make? <laughs> really, really, what part of yourself did you make? Who keeps your lungs moving at night when you sleep and your heart beating? Who, who, who allowed you to be born in the greatest nation in the 6,000 years of recorded history? Where what you work for, you get to keep. Well, not in California, but who, who allowed that? <laughs> You're not self-made. There is a designer and the two great laws of the universe is a God and you are not him. And the third great law is he has given you a savior. Now you must receive him. It's, it's, it's a grace gift, it requires receiving. Now it's, it's better to give than to receive, but in this case when you receive you give thanks in exchange. With a grateful heart that God would take you from the depravity of sin and he would place his spirit inside you and give you the strength to live for his truth the truth, that you would be used as an instrument to serve people. And, and I've, 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 I got this clarity. Are you depressed? Because there's two things I'll ask you if you tell me you're depressed. And I already know the answer to both questions. You don't do ministry for 30 years and not know the answer to the questions you're asking. You're depressed. One, are you reading your Bible? I already know the answer. No, you're not. You may lie, and I'll say, well, tell me what you've been reading. What's, what's fresh on your, well, John, John 3, 16. Always the verse, everyone. <laughs> yeah, they must have been watching a football game, and the guy's holding it up, and, oh, I better look that up. <laughs> and the other is, are you serving anybody? Sacrificially serving, giving to them. Now, when I say serving, it doesn't mean that you're holding it over their head. Do you realize how many times I cleaned your diaper? <laughs> That's not giving. That's, that's a blue chip stamp collection that you're cashing in on the children and you're gonna live vicariously through their lives because your was, yours wasn't good enough. Giving doesn't keep a record. I marvel at people who say, you know, I've tied to this church and I, I, I think it's, you know, it's sacrificially and I think it's time we have the privilege to go out to dinner with the, you and your wife. I said, well, I'd like to go out to dinner with my wife. Not with you. You're already, you wouldn't be pleasant company. <laughs> Were you going to say that to me? Because you're looking at me like, ooh, he's rough. <laughs> yeah, well, I am. It's, you get this many years in ministry, you get used to that. And you just say, look, I, I, I don't owe you anything. The Lord loves a cheerful giver, not out of guilt or compulsion. And, and that's, that's the beauty of what God has designed in his, in his family. 
There's a couple of quotes that I put down in relation to giving. Robert Louis Stevenson, don't judge each day by the harvest you reap, but by the seeds you plant. I thought that was great. Anne Frank said this, no one has ever become poor by giving. Amy Carmichael said, you can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. For God so loved the world that he gave. Martin Luther King Jr., who said the church is the soul of a nation, wrote, life's persistent and most urgent question is, what are you doing for others? Do you serve anyone just joyfully? Or do you keep a record of it so your, your kids can get their extracurricular whatever class stuff? Is there, is there any just non-recorded joyful giving in your life? Because if there isn't, there's depression. Always give without remembering and always receive without forgetting. My mother taught me that. I may not be good at thank you notes, but I pray for those who are generous and say thank you to the Lord. Ask them to, the Bible says, he, refre- he, he who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. That's my prayer for people like that. Lord, would you, would you bless them in the way that they've blessed me today? Would you just pour on them? Winston Churchill, this is one of my favorite quotes about giving. The guy was brilliant. We make a living by what we get. We make a life by what we give. Albert Schweitzer, when he looked at the depravity of man, survivor of Holocaust, he wrote, the only ones among you who will be really happy are those who will have sought and found how to serve. You lift yourself out of darkness and depression by serving others. You give of your life. I, I, I told my kids ministry is a terrible job this terrible job but it's a tremendous calling you get to see the best and the worst in humanity and you get to see God move in the deepest levels and and he gives you a a supernatural love for the difficult it's a tremendous calling it's a terrible job but a tremendous calling. I, I wouldn't stoop to do anything else. I love what I do. And, and I'm grateful for that. The Lord is a giving God. And he's created us in his image. We're image bearers. You know, you take all of Western Europe, multiply it by five of their benevolent giving. It doesn't equal what America gives. We're the most generous nation on the face of the earth. Because we have a Judeo-Christian heritage of giving. Giving. It's Christmas. It's a season where you give and receive. It's all about gifts. And it was spurred and motivated by the passage I shared earlier in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. John 3 goes on to say, he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation. That the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. That's a wonderful combination to the passage that is so known throughout the world. I I can debate you on a stage in front of a large audience and I can eviscerate you if you're questioning the existence of a savior And I will debate you as an atheist, and I will run circles around you. And that's not pride speaking. I've just been around long enough to know. You are, you're you're trying to survive off of an empty well. The, The insanity of atheism is beyond my ability to comprehend why anyone would be a sucker for that. You have to shelve your brain to be an atheist. Seriously. You, you look at the universe that screams of a designer and you say it happened by chance. Every cell of the human body is so intricate that it screams of a designer. There's nothing simplistic about it. It didn't just happen over eons. That's like saying you come upon a watch and you say, it's amazing. That watch appeared because lightning struck 
a cow and the strip of leather came off just like that and a bird came along and pecked holes right where the clasp would go in perfect sequence. And then the wind blew on the sand and beveled the, the glass on the watch and then, and then the thing, and, then, and it did, I swear. It just took a lot of time. Don't you think someone made it? I mean, it looked the parts and the, no, no. You're an idiot. And you know what? It has nothing to do with logic. You don't wanna, you don't wanna debate. You wanna go to your safe space and you wanna yell at me and, and throw ad hominem attacks. You don't wanna debate because you love evil and you love sin more than light and truth. And some of you in the room are lying right now. And you think you're getting away with it. You're not. You, you think you've pulled one over on your spouse or your kids. They're not the ones who are supposed to be watching you. God doesn't sleep or slumber. There's no shadow in his turning. All things are laid bare before his eyes. He knows, but you don't believe in him. And you're playing this charade. And even your family, the Bible says your sins will find you out. They know. And you, you think that you're pulling something off? The clock is ticking and you're going to breathe your last and exhale and stand before God and give an accounting of your life. And you're gonna say, I didn't know you existed. It's all creation screams of the glory of God. Four seasons, a child born, the intricacy of the human hand, the eyes alone, a designer, hello. But you don't love truth. You've been fed lies so often that, that it, it's become palatable for you. And as a man returns to his sin, it's like a dog returning to its vomit. That's scripture. It, it's so graphic, and I've seen it with my own eyes. Ooh. Steamy. Warm. They never serve it to me like that. You're like, Ugh. They're like, this is delicious. That's you. That's the sinner who thinks he's getting away with it. And God is offering a savior. But that word stops you because you love sin more than God. You love deceit more than truth. And you're not getting away with it. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. The sooner you come to that understanding, the better off you're gonna be in your entire family. Walk in the light as he is in the light. Confess your sins one to another, not unto salvation, but unto restoration. Walk in the truth. It's so much easier. It's just so much easier. And that's the picture. That's the picture of the idea that everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed, but he who does the truth comes to the light. Are you hungry for truth? Because born to you this day in the city of David is a savior. He's gonna be able to reconcile you to the Father. All you have to do is come to the Lord in honesty. It's real simple, watch this. I'm a sinner. Is that hard for you to say? It was for me early on, I'm a I'm a Bullseye, arrow. It's an archer's term, how far you've fallen from perfection. This is the bullseye, this is perfection, this is where your arrow is, this is the sin distance. Are you perfect? When you say I'm a sinner, you're saying I'm not perfect. Can, can we at least agree with that? Yeah. I'm not perfect, no duh. <laughs> and my sin, God, separates me from you, for the wages of sin is death. But you gave a savior who died in my place who was fully man, fully God, was tempted in all ways, but was without sin, so the grave couldn't hold him. And because he paid the penalty of death and rose from the grave, by faith we receive that gift of eternal life. We give him our sin, he gives us everlasting life. Wow. That's a pretty cool gift. Merry Christmas. Except for the prideful back there going, I'm self-made. We don't know what to get you. You can make it. 
Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus, for he himself, Jesus himself is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances so as to create in himself one new man from two thus making peace that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross thereby putting to death the enmity and he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near for through him we both have access by one spirit to the father he took care of the thing that separated us from the father and he shed his blood to do it he experienced the via dolorosa the way of pain and he had you on his mind Paul writes in the early part of Ephesians, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. That's a great gift. Jesus said to his disciples in Luke 12, do not fear, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He's a giving father. He's a giving father. and I'll conclude with three passages the first one is a story that I, I can't get out of my mind, especially in times like this. It's, it's in 1 Samuel 23. And David is running from Saul, who's trying to kill him. He's got 6,000 troops pursuing him in the wilderness. And, and, and David gets word that the citizens of Keilah are being overrun by the Philistines because it's the season where in a walled city you've harvested your wheat, and in a walled city, you, you throw the grain up and the wind blows and it separates the wheat from the chaff, but in a walled city, you don't get the breezes, so you have to go out of the city to the threshing floor, and there you throw up the wheat and the chaff blows away and the wheat settles and then you harvest it, and it's where you're most vulnerable because you're outside the city gates and you have all of your supplies for the coming year, and the Philistines were like the grasshoppers in a bug's life. They just waited for the ants to come outside the city gates and they came down and stole all their crop and they heard that the Philistines were, were attacking the threshing floor of Keilah. And, and David, he's gonna be king of Israel, Saul's king at the time and he has a burden for his people and he goes to the Lord, he says, what do you want me to do? And God says, go and save them. So he goes to his men, he says, look, I know we're, we're running from the 6,000 crack, tr crack troops of, of Saul but God wants us to go and protect the citizens of Keilah from the Philistines. They're like, what are you smoking crack? There's no way we're going to take on a two front. They didn't say that in the scripture. I put that there. <laughs> There's no way we're going to be able to put on a two fronted war. And he says, look, I'll go back and ask the Lord again, just to confirm he does. He says, look, fellas, this is what we're doing. You're with me or you're not. And they go, okay, we're with you. And they go down and the scripture says in, in, in first Samuel uh, 23, that David saved the citizens of Keilah. He saved them from death and starvation and he contended with his, his own life for their welfare. And David has secured their freedom, he saved their crop, and he goes to the Lord and he asks God two questions. He says, God, is Saul gonna come down and try to capture me in Keilah? And God, are the citizens of Keilah gonna betray me and give me up? David asked him two questions, and God gave him one answer. God says, yes, Saul's coming to get you. And David says, uh, Lord, I asked you two questions. You gave me one answer. I want to repeat the other one because you didn't answer that. Are the citizens of Keilah going to betray me? And God hesitantly, because he understands how heartbroken David must feel, says this. Will the men of Keilah deliver me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, yeah, they're going to do that to you. <laughs> I just saved their life. It's like, it's like you walk into the hierarchy of the city of Keilah. I want to sit with the council members. You pathetic, spineless, worthless human beings. We, our men just saved you. And you're going to throw us under the bus? We might as well just lop your heads off right now. 
You're a sorry excuse for humanity. You're takers. You're not givers. That's it. We just saved your life. And the first chance you get at repayment or, or, or being kind to us, you don't. You're going to throw us under the bus. You are a taker, a taker, a taker. David doesn't do that. Nowhere in Scripture is that recorded. Instead, the Scripture says David saddles his horse, gets on, and rides out of town. I'm like, dude, you, you could have read him the riot act. They need to be dressed down. They need to be addressed on this issue. Selfish human beings. I learned the secret of David. David wasn't doing it for the people of Keilah. He was doing it for the Lord. You see, you never get disappointed when you're serving the Lord and God tells you to serve flawed people. Because when they fail, you go, that's not my problem. I did what God asked me to do. He hasn't let me down ever. Oh, listen, it's very helpful for wives. It says, wives, submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. You know that passage that men love to quote? Woman, submit. And by the way, if that's you, fellas, you're a very weak man. She's doing it voluntarily. Give her reason to. Hello? Got real quiet. <laughs> but wives, I got to tell you, there's not a man on the planet worthy of submission. But God is. And God's asking you to submit to him. And in submitting to the Lord, you submit to the man. Well, that's a little easier to do because you can go to the Lord and go, okay, I'll submit to him. But you've got a problem on your hands, God. <laughs> You need to break him. You need to beat him like a rented mule. You've got to get through that thick skull of his and bring him to a place of compassion. And listen, if a, the scripture says if the husband doesn't listen to his wife, God hinders his prayers. That's just not fair. Michelle read that early on. She's been beating me with it ever since. She just, you know, I'm kidding. But the idea is, you know, I, if I don't listen, God hinders my prayers. The answer God wants to give you is through your spouse, but you're so prideful. Shut up and do as you're told and like it. If I want your opinion, I'll give it to you. You're having a rotten life. You don't have a ministry to your wife and to your kids. You don't have a ministry. Don't come to me and tell me, oh, God's called me in the ministry. Why is your wife so miserable? Well, that's right. I'm, they're, they're pagans. <laughs> God marvels at the ingratitude of humanity. He knew that that question being answered would break David's heart. That's the hardest part of ministry, is you watch people who take advantage of generous people. That's why I don't pass an offering bag. That's why I never ask you for your money. I never want that to be an issue, ever. That's between you and the Lord. It always has been and it always will be, period. End of story. This is about your life being freed from being possessed by your possessions. God gives you the chance to operate in life by faith. The Apostle Paul said, it'd be no resurrection, I'd be of all men most pitied. Because the life he lived was one of voluntary surrender and service in the kingdom. But the ingratitude of humanity as you serve them is, is crazy at times. I, I wanna read to you out of Luke chapter 17. And, and this is Jesus marveling at the ingratitude of, of humanity. I'm gonna wait for you to stop looking at these folks walking down the aisle. <laughs> we were talking in the green room how we should extend the, the curtain to the door so they can enter here, because everyone's like. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, just this. <laughs> Stay with me. We're almost finished. Jesus marveled at the ingratitude of man in Luke 17. Now it happened as Jesus went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And then as he entered a certain village, there met him 10 men who were lepers who stood afar off. They lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said to them, go show yourself to the priests. And so it was that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice glorified God. Ready? Ready? fell down on his face at his feet, and here it goes, giving 
thanks. And he was a Samaritan. So Jesus answered and said, we're not 10 cleansed, but where are the other nine? We're not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, arise, go your way, your faith has made you well. God healed him and he gave something to God. A secret my mother understood. A thank you note. Have you ever said that to the Lord? Thank you, God. Thank you for the skills you've entrusted to my care. Thank you for the family you've blessed me with that I would be a provider and a protector for them. Lord, thank you for a church family. Thank you for a community. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of health. Thank you for loved ones that are still with us. Thank you for kindness, tenderness. Thank you that you are my savior. Thank you, God, that you didn't leave me in this state, but you left the glory of heaven's throne for the humiliation of an earthly cross. That I would have my name written in the Lamb's book of life, that you would be my savior. You're the savior of the world, but you're my savior. And I give you, I give you thanks. There's something powerful about gratitude. It reflects in our life and all that we do. I'll close with this. Jesus speaking to his disciples in Luke 11. So I say to you, ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. Everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks it will be opened. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? God wants to give you a gift today. Not only does he want to give you a Savior, which is Jesus, he wants to give you his Spirit who will dwell in you and give you the strength to walk in the power of the Lord. You'll have the ability to say no to the things you never were able to say no to. You'll be a brand new creature in Christ. Your name will be written in the Lamb's book of life. This is a Christmas like no other. Two gifts awaiting you, a Savior and his Spirit to fill you. And all it requires, it's a grace gift, all it requires is asking him, may I have that? I've been waiting for you to ask me for that. Here you go. The Bible says you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and confess with your tongue, you will be saved to the glory of the Father. That's, that's been preached for thousands of years and the simplest of hearts get it and so do the wisest of hearts. The only ones who miss it are the prideful because you're not used to giving thanks. Why would you give thanks? You're, you're a gift to humanity. Look at you. You're the center of your universe. Well, the world doesn't need you. We needed a savior and you need a savior. And today is a day of salvation. This is the day where God wants to give you his son. And you know what you give in exchange? Thanks. That's a great gift that, what do you give to someone who has everything? That's God. You give him what he can't give except through a voluntary heart and that's thanks. That blesses the Lord. Give thanks with a grateful heart. The trials, right, Siaka? We give thanks. Give thanks in all things, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. It's a Christmas of thanks. We're giving thanks. I want to close by saying, God, thank you for this congregation. Amen. I've traveled the country. There's not a sweeter place on the planet. You are remarkable people. And it's a joy to spend Christmas with you. God, I give you thanks for them. What a wonderful Christmas this is. God bless you all. Merry Christmas. Amen. Would you stand with me? This is, is Melody, is this your fourth season with us or third? Third. Third. It's become a Christmas tradition. She brings her posse and don't mess with these guys. They're they're scary. Thank you all for coming out. Bless you all. All right, let's worship the Lord. Merry Christmas, everybody.